So uh, my name is Sally Ranney, and I'm president of Global Choices, which is an international organization with offices in London and Aspen. And our mission is the global commons with emphasis on the ice crisis of the polar regions, in particular, the unprecedented Arctic sea ice loss in the central Arctic Ocean, the ice shield, which is a cool, essential cooling system for the planet. And we're addressing that through short-term and long-term uh, proposed strategies. I'm also president and co-founder of the American uh, Renewable Energy In Institute, which is dedicated to the rapid implementation of renewable energy at the scale and speed commensurate to the, the climate crisis. And I'm delighted to um, uh, be the chair or the moderator of this session. Um, just a little bit of background to put the conversation in context is the New Green Deal was inspired by President Franklin Roosevelt's uh, a vast, if you will, uh, public works program to help us get out of uh, the depression. In the great in in the 1930s, and the Green New Deal uh, is is based on that uh, model, but seeks to fight climate change and tackle inequality simultaneously. So the basic principles, which most people don't know, were devised more than 10 years ago by a group of ac academicians and activists in response to the 2008 financial crisis. And most people don't know that the, the new Green Deal of the United States is non-binding. It's a resolution that passed the House of Representatives in 2019. And it calls for a launch of a 10, a 10 year national mobilization like the Franklin D. Roosevelt's New, New Deal did. But this is focused on reducing carbon emissions in the US and the costs of which were unclear at the time that it was, that it was proposed. It did not pass the Senate. Uh, and so it, is, um, uh, it stands as a framework uh, and and it, what it really was focused on uh, is focused on is um, reducing greenhouse emissions across the U.S. economy, but also guaranteeing high-paying jobs in clean industries, clean energy industries, and ensuring that vulnerable groups, uh, indigenous communities of color, migrant workers, etc. Um, the most vulnerable benefit from the green economy, the green economy defined as a sustainable economy that is environmentally sound and economically viable and socially responsible. And it also seeks uh, a very interesting aspect of the economy, an economic bill of rights the right to single payer health care, a guaranteed job at a living wage, affordable housing, and free college publication. But, and that's a lot. And it was um, highly criticized both within the Democratic Party and the Republicans that it was uh, the everything, including the kitchen sink, if you will. Now, prior to the Green New Deal, we had Obama's new clean power plan, which was initiated in 2014. That was um, not nearly as broad, obviously, but President Trump uh, scrapped that. And so now we have the Biden plan and the Biden plan is really a sea change. Um, and from my perspective, Having been in conservation and climate for some 40 years um, um, at different uh, levels of engagement, this arrived precisely at the moment in history when it's, when it's needed, uh, really in the nick of, nick of time. And Biden, during his campaign, said that the, new green, uh, the green New Deal was a critical framework, but he was not going to pursue it as such. And instead, he laid out his own plan, which I think um, uh, many of you uh, watching this session, I hope, have some reference to, because 
basically, to put it simply, Biden's economic agenda is his climate agenda. And his climate agenda is his economic agenda. He sees this as a jobs program, 16 to 20 million jobs, while focusing on what needs to be done in the short term and the long term uh, for climate change. So it's an all in government approach from agriculture to electric vehicles and transport infra infrastructure uh, with charging stations uh, across the country. It includes carbon free electricity by 2035, more wind and solar to get the nation to net zero emissions and and 100 percent clean energy by 2050. And he also uh, wants to upgrade millions of buildings and homes uh, to be more energy efficient, plug in, uh, excuse me, plug abandon all oil and gas wells, which is a big problem, reclaim mines and make environmental justice a key. And of course, building resiliency to climate disasters and restoring nature's infrastructure, wetlands, forests, etc. And of course, his cabinet picks and his appointments of Senator John Kerry and Gina McCarthy as special climate envoys really express that he has an all in government uh, approach. So uh, the price tag for that is two trillion dollars per year uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, the Green New Deal was estimated uh, with all its um, uh, components was estimated at 10 uh, trillion per year. So <laughs> it's hard in the United States to please everyone, obviously. Um, and the Democrats say Biden doesn't go far enough and the Republicans call it a socialist manifesto. So we have to really go back to COP and Paris uh, where everybody agreed that the industrial polluting nations, the United States, et cetera, agreed with the rest of the world that the existing global warming cap of two degrees Celsius would lead to catastrophic change. And so we've got COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland in November of this year. And it is perhaps, many are saying, um, the last chance to get this right within the time frame we have, because um, the most recent one of the most recent reports by the IPCC, the Panel on Climate Change, International Panel on Climate Change, is that we have to keep the increase below one point C, and we have about twelve years um, to take dramatic worldwide action. And so science has never been more clear. Now it's how do we take the science and apply it um, at the local uh, and global levels. So it's within that context that I would like to call, um, that I would like to frame um, this conversation. And I'd like to call on the Honorable uh, Diego Mesa, who is Minister of Mines and Energy for Colombia, and he will prepare his pre-recorded remarks. But before he does, I, I would I would like to introduce him. Um, he he is a globally minded energy sustainability and extractive uh, industries leader over the last fifteen years uh, in senior management and advisory roles in government, multilaterals, and the private sector. He was appointed to um, as a minister of uh, energy and mines in uh, in June of 2020, and before that, he served as deputy energy um, minister uh, for two years. He led the he led the design and the implementation of the country's energy transformation policy, which he's going to share with us. And Colombia is positioned as the third economy in South America in the energy transition index of 2019 of the, uh, of the World Economic For Forum after Uruguay and, and Chile. And before joining uh, the Colombian government, uh, he spent six years with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, 
where he led technical assistance missions to uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, East, um, Middle Eastern countries on fiscal issues uh, involving extractive industry, including tax policy, um, revenue management, forecasting, et cetera. So, and before that, um, he was uh, in Canada and serving as um, a manager and senior economist for Price Waterhouse Cooper. So, uh, with that, if you could please um, share his video. Hello, as Colombia Minister of Energy and Mines, it's an honor and a pleasure to participate at this extraordinary meeting convened by Horace's Global Visions community. I would like to thank uh, for this space and particularly I would like to thank Mr. Frank Jorgen Reister for inviting me to speak about the Colombian vision on how we're fighting climate change. First, I would like to say that Colombia has increased its commitment uh, with the fight against climate change. Uh, under the Paris Agreement, we had committed before to reduce CO2 emissions by 20% in 2030, but as the President of Colombia, uh, President Duque, said on, on December, we're now going to decrease by 51% by 2030. We're also working to lay out the path to get to net zero by 2050. From the energy sector, we're working on many different angles. The first one in which we've been accelerating our efforts is the massification of variable uh, energy. And we are able to say now that in less than four years, we're going to go from less than 0.5% of our power matrix made up of variable renewable energy to 12% uh, in 2022. And this will obviously complement our matrix, which is heavily dependent on hydropower, which means we will have one of the cleanest power matrix in the whole world. We're also working on other technologies such as carbon capture use and storage. We're also laying up the roadmap for green hydrogen and also exploring geothermal potential. We believe that all these actions from the energy sector will contribute to uh, position Colombia as one of the regional leaders in the fight against climate change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, very much uh, for your comments. And it is very gratifying to see uh, what the vision is for Colombia moving forward in transitioning to, to uh, renewable energies. And I know that you uh, particularly are um, dedicated to moving that process along as, as quickly as possible. Our next speaker is Tom Steyer. Um, Tom left his successful investing business to give his own money, time, and energy to one of the country's leading forces in registering more young Hi, voters Steyer. and voters of color fighting climate change, working for racial justice and helping secure better lives for all Americans. Every single debate, he won on From founding voter mobilization organization Next Gen America to spearheading impeachment of Trump with need to impeach, uh, which was a, position, uh, a petition that had reportedly had more signatures on it than any other petition put forward in the United States. Uh, Tom has led a number of people first grassroots campaigns that have repeatedly defeated powerful special interests. He has mobilized grassroots efforts to, big, to beat big oil to win clean air laws, force big tobacco to pay its share of healthcare costs, and close a billion dollar corporate loop, tax loophole uh, so that schools uh, would get more funding. Most recently, Tom was uh, a former Democratic presidential candidate. In 2020, he served as co-chair of California Governor Newsom's Business and Jobs Recovery Task Force. That was after 
uh, the horrific fires that we had in California. He also co-chair Vice President Biden's Climate Engagement Envi Advisory Council to help mobilize climate voters. He will continue to work to make Americans re-up the benefits of climate action in Hi, I'm Tom Steyer. Joe Biden campaigned on climate. He talked about it every single day. He ran advertising on it. He talked about it in every single debate. He won on climate. And his election, when we look back, will be, be seen as the inflection point for the American response to climate. Everything he's done in his administration so far, the team that he's chosen, the executive actions that he's taken, have absolutely lived up to his promise to the American people to respond to this crisis effectively. We can see the change clearly in the political sphere, but it's broader than that. We can see the change in the polling of Americans across the board. We can see it in Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And more than that, we can see a sea change in the response to this crisis from the private sector, from the business class, in America. And I'm not just talking about the public announcements from huge corporations like GM and Ford or huge financial institutions like JP Morgan or the reinsurers. I'm talking about the conversations that I'm having on a daily basis with people across America looking at the two to three trillion dollars that need to be spent every year for the next 30 years to rebuild this country, but also to build the world in a clean way that's sustainable, safe, and healthy. This is an inflection point, and as an American, it's absolutely incumbent upon us to seize this moment so that we can participate in the change that has to happen. The clean infrastructure plan that the Biden-Harris campaign ran on, and which the Biden administration is now talking about, provides the framework for the kind of change that we need to enable the private sector to build the economy that is going to be safe and healthy. But it's more than that. That infrastructure plan also fulfills the promise of creating millions of good-paying union jobs across this country and of environmental justice. Undoing generations of pollution concentrated in underserved communities across this country and at the heart of this plan is the need to respond to that deep injustice. So we're talking about responding to the biggest challenge we've ever had from the natural world. We're talking about broad spread prosperity, equitable prosperity, and about a commitment to the kind of basic justice that America has always claimed we're committed to. But it goes beyond that too. Because America's willingness to pass a clean infrastructure bill sets the stage for us to participate and be part of the leadership in the UN conference in Glasgow in November of this year. That conference is the follow-up to Paris in 2015, and it will set the stage, the framework, for how the world responds to our climate crisis over the next five years. And we all know the next 10 years are our one chance to respond effectively to this huge natural crisis. And those first five years are probably the most important five years that will ever happen in terms of our response to climate change. We are at a point now, not of whether to respond to this crisis. That question has been put aside. That's what the inflection point means. We're only talking now about how best to respond, how urgently and how effectively. That's where we all are right now. This is our moment. We understand exactly what needs to be done. We've passed the time of discussing whether to react to it. The question for everybody who's listening to me, for people across the board is this, will we live up to what needs to be done? Will we live up to our vision of ourselves, of who we believe we are? and who we have always wanted to be and said we were. This is our moment. 
Thank you, Tom. Um, Tom is one of the most articulate, the most passionate, one of the most experienced uh, climate advocates uh, and climate solutions advocate and investors uh, in the United States. And I really want to thank him for his years of of involvement and engagement uh, at this at this level. The next speaker is uh, Boinga. I think that's the way you pronounce your name, Anderson. And Mr. Anderson is president and CEO of Yazaki North and Central America and president of Yazaki Europe and Africa. He's responsible for more than uh, I think it's about 140,000 of the 243,000 team members you have across 28 countries and about 8 billion in revenue, uh, annual revenue. And he also leads the company's purchasing activities. Officer in the Swedish Armed Forces. And I understand you began your career at Saab AB where you were uh, Vice President of Purchasing, and then joined General Motors in 1993, progressing through several uh, roles before taking over the entire uh, operation in 1999. And in 2001, he was promoted to Group by P Vice President for Global Purchasing and Supply Chain, becoming a member of GM's top management team, and was instrumental in cutting $2 billion from GM's purchasing and supply chain costs, buses, specialty vehicles, heavy trucks. And this group launched several new vehicles while um, you were CEO. And then you took the company from losses of 1 billion in 2008 to consistent profits. Then I believe it was in 2013, uh, you were appointed the first non-Russian CEO of Avtovaz, Russia's largest automaker, which manufactured cars under the Lada brand, Renault, Nissan, and Datsun, and then nominated for Person of the Year in 2015 for uh, your transformative work at Adivaz. Then before joining um, uh, the company now, uh, Yazaki now, um, from 2016 to July of 2017, you led the Bow Group Industries as an industry advisor for both global automotive and non-automotive uh, organizations. So it is with um, much pleasure that uh, I uh, welcome you to this session and I'm very much looking forward to your remarks. Thank you very much for that great introduction. Today, I will represent the automotive industry both as an OEM, as a supplier. As a supplier, Yasaki, we have our components in every third combustion engine vehicle and in every second hybrid and in every second full electric. So we are supporting the transformation going from combustion engines to electric engines and we are doing that every day. Today we have Toyota as our main customer that is a leader in hybrid and we are also a supplier to Tesla. Secondly, being a very large employer, we are providing opportunities to reduce our CO2 emissions, reducing water usage and electricity usage. And the last 10 years, we have reduced our consumption 35%. And the last piece is what is our contribution to society? A couple of hours ago, I was on with General Baltadano, that is the head of the free trade zone in Nicaragua. Yasaki is the largest employer in Nicaragua, and we have 15,000 employees. And I'm happy to say that we pay 88% more than the minimum salary. We provide health care, 
to our employees and we give them the first opportunity to get to the doctor and get medicine. Last, being a very large employer of females, the last years we have recorded that 98.6% of our female population are taking the granted parental leave. So that's my three points to this very complex and large discussion, being a simple man in a simple industry that is not that sexy, but still turns around $10 trillion every year. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was um, reading about your company, and you have had a 75-year a, a commitment to the environment. Um, and that's that's remarkable, uh, definitely. And you're also addressing now the what is called uh, the intersectionality, better wages, gender considerations, and that also is something that I want to talk about uh, when we get into our discussion. Our next and uh, last speaker is Piteri Talis. And I just want to say quickly that um, uh, as weather, climate, and the water cycle have no national boundaries, international cooperation at a global scale is absolutely essential. And for the development of meteorology, climatology, and uh, operational hydrology, uh, as well as, you know, looking at how do you reap the benefits from their application. And so that's the World Meteorological Organization that provides that framework uh, through, the, through the UN. And it is also uh, the scientific arm of the IPCC. And um, uh, Mr. Tallis is the Secretary General uh, of the W, um, uh, excuse me, um, I'm having a technical problem here, I'm sorry, uh, of, the, of the World Meteorologic Organization. And before that, uh, he, he was director of the Finnish Meteorologic Institute from 2002 to 2015, which was interrupted for about two years when he served as director of the WMO Development and Regional Activities Department. So his career at uh, FMI started in 1986, where he had several roles, uh, head of research, scientist, leader of ozone research, uh, and and um, uh, also taking on a, a role as a professor of remote sensing before taking the helm of the Institute. And as the leader of the Institute, uh, he became known in the Finnish media as Mr. Climate Change. He's been active in the international scene throughout his uh, entire career. And uh, in one of the interviews, he was very clear, one of the uh, interviews that I read, he was very clear that there is a, uh, that he is, is under a mandate, um, a three-part mandate for the WMO, and that's the Paris Accord, the Sendal uh, Framework for D Disaster Risk Reduction and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And I also read, which will be great for our conversation, is that he holds a view that the uh, apocalyptic approach to uh, climate change should be instead a time for really thinking thoroughly and calmly about what needs to be done and how to do it. Absolutely to stick to the scientific facts, that is the WMO's mission as it is for Secretary Tallis. We're uh, delighted to have you with us and please, um, let's hear your comments. Thank you, thanks for the opportunity to address you and uh, greeting from Geneva, it's a beautiful sunny afternoon here and uh, Lake Geneva is, uh, is, uh, is, is in fairly good shape uh, just by my window. 
So uh, WMO is the United Nations Special Rights Agency on Weather, Climate and, and Water. And we are also monitoring the global greenhouse gas uh, uh, status. Uh, we are hosting IPCC here. And I'm also personally a member of the Secretary General Guterres uh, Climate Core Group. And, uh, and there we are at the moment very much uh, doing preparatory work for the COP26, which is uh, going to be hosted by UK in, in November this year. Uh, from WMO side, we are publishing uh, status of climate uh, reports, and uh, in our recent reports, we have been able to demonstrate that we have uh, seen the 1.2 degree warming so far, and uh, there's 24 percent probability that we would uh, reach the lowest limit of Paris Agreement 1.5 already during the coming coming five years, at least on temporary basis. We have seen sea level rise by 26 centimeters so far, for than. And, and there has been a boost in sea level rise. Uh, we have stored more than 90% of the extra heat uh, that we have produced to the planet, uh, the oceans, and, uh, and the seawater mass has, uh, has been warming. We have been breaking records in, in main greenhouse gas concentrations re during recent uh, years, uh, year by year, in carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, this COVID crisis uh, has led to a drop of, uh, of the emissions by 7%, uh, but we haven't seen major improvement in the atmospheric uh, concentrations uh, so far. And there has been a boost in uh, melting of glaciers and uh, also the Arctic sea ice that you have been talking about. And, uh, and we have uh, practically lost uh, multi-year ice there, and, uh, and we have lost uh, more than 70% of the sea ice uh, mass from the, from the, from the Arctic. Uh, we have seen also uh, increase in the amount of disasters as a follow-up of this, uh, this uh, change. Uh, we have started seeing growing amount of heat waves, uh, droughts in some parts of Africa, uh, Africa especially, forest fires in California, Colorado, Canada, Siberia, Australia, and Sweden. And, um, and, and uh, we have uh, also been seeing, started seeing growing amount of tropical storms, and uh, for example, last year we broke uh, the all-time high in the amount of uh, of hurricanes in Caribbean. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and this all has uh, had also economic impacts. Uh, these economic uh, losses they have tripled uh, during the past uh, twenty years, and, uh, and and we have seen that growth also in, in the United States, uh, uh, where the especially hurricanes have been very expensive events. Uh, luckily, we have been able to prevent human life uh, uh, thanks to uh, improved uh, early warning services, and, uh, and and there has been a slight decrease in in that uh, sense. And in, in in our IPCC report a couple of years ago, we demonstrated that uh, that for the welfare of uh, mankind and welfare of the biosphere, it would be uh, uh, desired to aim at reaching 1.5 degrees instead of uh, the upper limit of. Uh, Paris Agreement, uh, two degrees. And, uh, and, and recently we have heard uh, uh, good news. Uh, uh, most recent ones are coming from the United States. Uh, you have also uh, decided to join Paris Agreement and uh, you aim at becoming carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, European Union, Japan, South Korea, South Africa, UK have already done it before. And in September, uh, Xi Jinping from China announced that they are aiming at uh, becoming carbon neutral by 2060. We have growing amount of private sector companies who are behind those targets and, uh, and also growing amount of uh, finance uh, institutions. We have technical uh, and economic means to be successful in, in climate uh, mitigation. Uh, we, we, we should convert uh, our energy and transport systems uh, to be based on, uh, on, on, uh, uh, on renewable energy uh, uh, hydropower, nuclear energy, and in, in transportation, electric uh, cars, uh, bioenergy, uh, hydrogen, and, uh, and also public transportation. At the moment, we produce 85% of the energy based on, 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 on fossils, and uh, only 15% is based on, on, on climate-friendly ones. So that's our major challenge for the coming, coming decade. In land use, uh, we should uh, uh, produce less feed for cattle, and, uh, and, and, and stop uh, deforestation. That's uh, about 14% of the problem. 86% of the problem is, re is related to the use of fossil, 
fossil uh, energy. And this conversion, which is going to take place worldwide, that's, that's also a great uh, opportunity. It's a great business opportunity, and uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm confident that the winners will be the ones who are who are the forerunners in this uh, this case. So far, we haven't seen any, anything positive happening in the real atmosphere, and uh, and the challenge ahead of us is uh, that we should have ambitious uh, programs for for the coming decade as well. So it's not enough to promise something. That something might happen in 2050 or 2060, but uh, to be serious in this mitigation, we have to make uh, plans only for the coming coming years. And, and one of the challenges that we are also seeing from United Nations uh, perspective is, is the population growth. That means that we are going to see more victims of uh, climate change, especially in Africa and uh, Southern Asia, but uh, also in the long run, we may see more consumers. And, and besides uh, Climate mitigation. We should also pay attention to to population growth and control it uh, much better than we have been doing so far. With these words, thanks for the opportunity to address you, and uh, and I'm, I've been happy with to, to join join this uh, important event. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. You covered um, <laughs> you covered the whole landscape literally, and um, we do have amazing challenges. And we have a few minutes left, and I'd, I'd like to ask both of you: uh, Do you really think at COP26 that we are going to see the world community as a one humanity, as a unit, step up? to what actually needs to be done now, given what is on the horizon as far as climate catastrophes and how far reaching and how deep they're going to be if we don't take this action. Uh, so, Mr. Anderson? Absolutely, we, we have no other choice, uh, but I also think as individuals, we need to ask ourselves, does it make sense to by Italian water that is shipped from Italy to US. And I can give you many examples, but I, I'm an optimist. I'm sure that we will take this initiative together, but I also ask each one of you to look at your individual habits and see what you can change to save the climate. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Secretary? Yes, so from my side, uh, I've been following this climate uh, debate since, since the 80s when I started studying meteorology. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then this uh, thing called climate change was a secret thing among the meteorology community. And, and now it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a part of the mainstream uh, everywhere uh, among the governments, uh, among the businesses and uh, among the citizens uh, of, the, of this uh, this planet, and, and there's a good reason to be fairly optimistic. Uh, so far, we have two thirds of the uh, world's uh, emissions uh, behind uh, behind this uh, carbon neutrality commitment, uh, 2050 or 2060. And, uh, and our aim, uh, as, as UN, is that we would see at least 90% of the of the global emissions under such uh, 